coming up. This I've used all my masks for school and going places. And I don't have time to wash them. Can I wear the same one twice? That answer and more just ahead. Plus, Pandemonium will check in with the National Zoo to see how the new Panda Cub is doing and an exclusive look inside the zoo's Panda Cam room. And then, can you say slime? Did you see that? The slime jumped up. Kate, the chemist is back with a cool new experiment you can try at home. This is NBC Nightly News, Kids Edition. Welcome back to Nightly News Kids Edition. It's great to be with you. One of our favorites, Kate the Chemist, is going to drop by today with another cool experiment you can try at home. Also, Jackson Daly has an exclusive look at the new baby panda at the National Zoo. But first, let's get to the news. Here's what you need to know. The presidential election is just about a month away, and President Trump and Vice President Biden held the first presidential debate this week in Cleveland. Also, new cases of the coronavirus continue to pop up across the country. School districts are keeping a close eye. We know some schools have had to close and switch to remote learning after cases have popped up. Also, officials say several players and staff on the Tennessee Titans football team have come down with the virus, forcing the NFL to postpone the game between the Titans and the Steelers this weekend. Now let's get to your questions. Joining us is our pal, Dr. John Torres. Dr. John, our first question comes from Colorado. Hi, my name is Sienna and I'm nine years old. I live in Evergreen, Colorado. My, my question for you is if I've used all my masks for school and going places and I don't have time to wash them, can I wear the same one twice? Thanks. Bye. Sienna, good question. Thanks for that. Dr. John, what about it? And it is a good question, and the important part is to wear the mask to protect you and others from coronavirus or from spreading it or catching it. And what you want to do at the beginning of the day is definitely put on a clean mask when you're going out and about. But if you've used up all your masks and you don't have any others that are clean, then look at the mask you've used and find the one that's used for the least amount of time and the one you used when you weren't around many people. That's the safest one to wear. So go ahead and wear that one. But when you get back home, especially before you go to bed, either you or your parents, make sure you wash all the masks, let them dry overnight. That way you have a huge variety of masks to pick from the next day. And with a smiley face. All right, our next question comes from Texas. My name is Lucas Ten Hive and I live in Dallas, Texas. And my question is, when you go out to eat food, is there a slight chance there might be coronavirus on it? I'm a big fan of Nightly News Kids Edition. All right, Lucas, thanks very much for that. Dr. John? You know, I think a lot of people think this question when they're eating out, but the important thing is that the food itself, there's a very, very, very small chance that they have, could have coronavirus, especially if it's food that's been cooked. So you don't have to worry too much about your food. Instead, worry about where you are eating at the time. If you do go to a restaurant, you want to eat outdoors instead of indoors. That's going to be much safer. But regardless of whether you're outdoors or inside, you want to make sure that you do that social distancing. You stay six feet away from other people and pick a table where people won't be walking by within that six foot distance because that could put you at higher risk as well. And then of course, make sure you wear a mask before you go to the restaurant and after you leave the restaurant because that can keep you safe as well. But as far as the food, go ahead and enjoy it. The risk is extremely low. All right, our last question comes from Maryland. Hello, Lester. I'm Sophie. And I am Josh. And and we're from Maryland. And my question is, why are you most likely to have the flu in winter? Bye. We love Kids Edition. Oh, bye. Thanks, doc Dr. John. What about that? You know, this is a very interesting question, and it has to do with the fact that the flu virus really likes cold weather. It's much more active in cold weather, and it can spread to other people quicker. On top of that, if you think about it, when it's cold, we tend to move indoors, which means we're not going to social distance as much. Plus, we tend to have colds, meaning runny noses, coughs, sneezes, and that makes it more likely to spread the virus as well. Now, you might think, okay, we're wearing masks. 
We're washing our hands. We're social distancing. Isn't that going to keep the virus at bay, make it a less of a flu season? We don't know that for sure. So the important thing to do is make sure you get your flu shot now. But on top of that, go ahead and continue to wear your masks, continue to wash your hands, continue to social distance. And when you can open a window, that'll help get some fresh air in there. That's your best way of avoiding the flu. All right, Dr. John Torres, thanks as always. And kids, thanks to you for your great questions. All right, now let's switch gears and head to Washington, D.C., where visitors to the Smithsonian National Zoo are seeing in black and white these days. Just over a month ago, giant panda May gave birth to a baby cub who has captured hearts all across the world. Our very own Jackson Daly took us inside the zoo's panda cam room for an exclusive look at how the little cub is doing. Thanks, Mr. Holt. So that baby panda is now one month old and just had his first exam. I got the chance to talk to the big panda keeper at the National Zoo, and I also got a sneak peek into their camera room. Take a look. Hi, Mr. Deary. Um, I'm Jackson, and I just, I just had to say, I love your title as a giant panda keeper. Right? <laughs> Pretty cool. <laughs> there aren't very many of us, so it's an exclusive club. I just had to say I love that name. Um, <laughs> So I'm here, um, and I wanted to ask you um, about the baby panda. Does he have a name? Not yet. Um, so we, even at this point, don't know the gender of the cub, so we don't know if it's a boy or a girl. Um, we're hoping to know that by next week. So, And then we'll kind of come up with a process to name the cub after that. It was born about like a month ago. How is it doing? It's doing great. So um, we know we, we got hands on it at about three, three and a half weeks. And at that time, it weighed about a pound and a half. And they just weighed it again yesterday, and it now weighs about three pounds. So in the last, uh, what is that? It's about, about a week, it's gained almost a pound and a half. So it's doing really well. Mom's taking really good care of it. Everything's going really well for the cub. Wow, pandas are born at a pound and a half? They're about born less than that. So the cubs at birth weigh about 100 to 200 grams. So wow. they're really tiny. Um, and so we didn't get our hands on it until it was about uh, three weeks old. Wow, that's that's crazy. Uh, how does it survive that that small of a being? So the the main things is that mom is the one taking care of it, but the whole time. So what she'll do is she's in a little den. She's in that little enclosed space in the wild. It would be um, a tree hollow or a cave or something like that. In our enclosure, it's a small uh, room off of a larger room. She can come and go as she chooses, um, but for the first you know, three to four weeks, she spent almost her entire time in that room. So she's feeding the cub at the early stages, every hour to two hours, it would want a nurse. And then the other thing that she's doing that's really critical is that cub cannot maintain its own body temperature. So you know how you and I, if you took your temperature, it's always about the same. Well, that cub can't do that until it's about four or five weeks old. So mom has to hold it. Literally, she holds it up against her body to keep it warm so it doesn't freeze. So she basically spends the first almost month in that den, hardly eating, not drinking very much, but that's very normal for her. That's crazy. Well, like yeah. dedication. Um, it is very when, dedication, yeah. When do you think that you'll um, find out the gender of the panda? So we're hoping that it will be about hopefully next week or early the week after. Um, we had to send it to our genetics team. We, we took a swab um, from the baby's cheek, and that's how we'll be able to determine the sex of the cub. So baby pandas, when they're born, what like color do they start out? Do they start out black and white? No. So they're born um, pretty pink looking. Um, they have a very, very slight coating of white. It's hard to see. They look mostly pink. Um, but within the first week, the black and white markings start to come in. So we started noticing the ears were black, the, um, the legs, the back straps, so the strap of black that goes across their back. All of that started to come in at about a week of age. So Pretty early on, they start looking like a panda. How long will the um, mother panda nurse him? And then when can the baby panda eat like bamboo or like real food? So the, to answer your first question, the cub stays with its mom on average about a year and a half to two years. Um, it's not necessarily nursing from her the, that whole time. Usually they stop nursing at about a year, a little after a year. But the, they'll stay with their mother for protection and to learn kind of the ropes uh, for that first year and a half to two years. But the cub will start to mouth food probably in the four to six month range. Yeah, um, my little baby sister is six months and she just started eating like sweet potatoes, like yeah. bananas. You have that whole board of cameras. Um, how do you like 
pay attention or how do you like control all of it? So this is, if for any of your viewers that were of my age, this looks a lot like an Atari joystick. I don't know if you've ever played with an Atari. So yeah. they have this, you kind of move it around so I can move it. So I don't know if you can see the cam on the, um, on the oh, screen yeah, I there. Can see it. So I'm able to rotate the cam around. All these cams are what we call pan tilt zoom. So they can move in almost a 360 degree range. And then if I twist the knob, I can zoom in or zoom out. So I can get closer to the cob um, and mom and whatever it is that I'm looking at. How many um, pandas do you have at the zoo? So right now we have three. So the two on the screen are Mei Shong, that's the mother, and then her cub. And then the father, his name is Tian Tian. Um, and pandas are, are bears, just like any bear. The fathers don't play any role in the re rearing of young. So he will never be in the same enclosure with his baby. Um, we'll always make sure that they're separated. Um, we have never seen in giant pandas that fathers can be dangerous, but we do know in other bears um, that they sometimes will go after their babies. So we don't wanna, we don't wanna do that. Um, there will be opportunities for the, the cub and its father to actually see each other through, we call it howdy mesh. So there'll be um, mesh areas between them where they'll be able to kind of look at each other, but they're never gonna be in the same enclosure. And that's totally normal. The father in the wild would, would really have nothing to do with its baby. Uh, yeah, that's nice. Uh, at least you get to see the father. Exactly. Uh, thank you so much for doing this with me, uh, Mr. Deary. And if you wanna see more of that cute baby cub, and I honestly don't know why you wouldn't, you could go right here to the National Zoo's website. Back to you, Mr. Holt. All right, Jackson Daly, that was really great, thanks. Finally, we wanna talk science and something cool you might be able to try at home with a little help from a grown-up. Here to show us is our friend, Kate Bierberdorf. Kate is the author of Kate the Chemist, the big book of experiments, and she also has a new fiction book out, Kate the Chemist, The Great Escape. Kate, always great to have you on with us again today. We're going to talk about an experiment, but before we do that, you think it's probably a good idea if they have a parent or a grown-up in the room, right? Possibly. Yeah, for this one, it's probably a really good idea to just grab an adult or any grown-up, just have them come over and have do science. Awesome. Now, you've got the word slime in this, exper in this experiment, so you obviously got our attention. Tell us what we're going to do. I am making magnetic slime today um, because my book, The Great Escape, just came out and it's a fiction series about a little 10-year-old Kate the chemist who goes around her neighborhood and solves everyday problems. And in the book, I always include an at-home experiment and that one is called magnetic slime. And they actually use it in the story, but I don't wanna give too much away. Um, but we're gonna do magnetic slime today. And all you need for this one is about a half a cup of glue. Make sure it's quality glue. You don't wanna use cheap dollar store glue here because you want the good polyvinyl acetate so you want good glue here then you need a quarter cup of iron oxide powder now I have like buckets of this at my house but you may not and so if you don't just go outside grab some at like a local craft store um, you can also easily order this online and then the last thing you need is a quarter cup of contact solution or saline solution and if you have all of these three things and a special magnet then you can make magnetic slime that's awesome, so tell us how it works. It's very simple. So you're going to start first with the glue, then you'll grab your iron oxide powder and dump it right in. Then you'll give it just a quick little stir. You wanna mix the black powder into the glue. So you want a beautiful, nice homogenous mixture. So nice and black and gunky there. And then as soon as you have essentially a black paste, what I want you to do is add your saline solution. And then this is the fun part. It's going to start poly to polymerize. So the polyvinyl acetate in the glue and then the borate ions in the um, contact solution are gonna come together and have a chemical change which polymerizes. Now, I've learned that it actually works best if you set it aside for a little bit. And so I got up really early this morning to make some special magnetic slime for you all. Um, so this one I made at 6 a.m. and it is absolutely amazing so it should have this like lovely slime goopy texture um it kind of has like a silly putty feel but then the coolest part is because we added iron oxide it's magnetic so we have this wonderful magnet this neodymium magnet and what's going to happen <gasps> did you see that the slime jumped up it like defied gravity and jumped up to the magnet because it's magnetic slime it's so cool so i'll do it again so you can see it <gasps> and it jumps up and so it like actually i hope you can see this jumping up i think it's just like the coolest thing to watch it defy gravity. Isn't that amazing? 
That really is. That's really very cool. And some very simple scientific uh, principles at work there, right? Exactly. We're just having a chemical change to make a polymer in the slime. And then we're just taking advantage of like magnetic fields and magnets to make it fun. Well, Kate, thanks so much. Congratulations on your latest book and all you're doing. It's really great to have you stop by. Thank you. Good to see you. All right. Well, that's going to do it for us. Thanks for watching, everybody. Before we say so long, parents, just a reminder, if your child has a question, send a video to us at nightlynewskids at nbcuni.com. We'll see you next time. And remember, please take care of yourself and each other.